My name is Dr. Suzanne Wertheim. My title is CEO and founder of Worthwhile Research and Consulting. A lot of people come to me and they ask, why is inclusive language important? And one of the things is that, well, actually at the very core, it's not even just one of the things, is that every single thing that you say and write can cause a relationship to improve or deteriorate possibly stay at the same level. But honestly, what we found is that conversations that go okay still actually cause a relationship to improve just by having a conversation. Language can feel like a minefield. And what's happening today is that 21st century etiquette is causing people to rethink how to be polite to people, how to be respectful to people, how to draw people in. If you are using old-fashioned or antiquated or um, in other ways problematic language, it can really lower trust in you. People may think that you don't understand their position, their experience, their perspective. So the more you can demonstrate with your language that you've thought through the different kinds of people in the world and that you recognize who's out there, the better it is for laying groundwork for trust in you. A lot of people, when they think about inclusive language, get very nervous. And one reason is that they get overwhelmed thinking about all the different kinds of people. How am I going to remember who's out there and what I'm supposed to not say to them? It can become really exhausting and and fear-inducing. So my six principles of inclusive language are reflect reality, show respect, draw people in, incorporate other perspectives, prevent erasure, and recognize pain points. All of these are common sense. And I think people, when they see them, they're like, yeah, sure. And I think it's funny because it's actually decades of research in multiple languages and so much complicated data. But sometimes when you're reaching something true, It's because you've boiled something down to its essentials. And these are universal principles, as far as I can see, gathering data from multiple languages in multiple countries. And so the ways that you might show respect to somebody in a way that lands as respectful to them is going to change from person to person and culture to culture. So that's when you start to have conversations about that. A way somebody's going to feel included without, I imagine, an issue that you face is people feeling condescended to. So how can you make people feel drawn in but not condescended to? Let me give you an example of reflecting reality that I think is pretty relevant to the work that you all are doing. And that is avoid linguistic distortions, right? So there are two linguistic distortions in particular that are important when we are holding people accountable. Because I imagine, and we'll dive into this more, that a big part of your work is accountability. So the two linguistic distortions that I see again and again in all kinds of workplaces and in families and other kinds of personal relationships are what I call inflating language and softening language. So inflating language is when somebody is behaving reasonably and usually because of who they are, the language used to describe them and their behavior pushes the description into uh, unacceptable, problematic, difficult. So, for example, somebody dissenting or somebody pointing out a problem or somebody saying, hey, th- this is this was bi-, somebody pointing out bias. If they're from a marginalized group, very often their dissent will not be accepted. If they're speaking authoritatively or if they're calling out bias, they'll be described as the problem. So we hear this, for example, I'll just use gender as an example. So women are supposed to behave and talk in subordinate ways. So if women speak with authority or dissent or call out a problem and say this is a problem, we see words like hysterical, emotional, bitch, um, so many different kinds of words that are saying that a woman speaking with authority and calling out a problem, that she herself is the problem. And then inflating language works hand in hand with this other linguistic distortion, which is softening language. Softening language is when problematic behavior, usually by somebody with power, is described in a way to to suggest that it is acceptable. 
And so in the workplace, I'll hear things like, oh, boys will be boys, or he has good intentions to um, just shunt aside sexual harassment. Um, he's just curious. She just has high standards. There's so many things that people will say just is a good clue that softening language is something that's happening, right? So um, these two things work hand in hand. So three important takeaways that I'm hoping people will leave with are, first of all, it's important to have the language to elicit good constructive feedback. Two, really coming to terms with the fact that you're going to make mistakes and getting a game plan for mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen. There is a 0% chance you're not going to make mistakes. And then three, I'm hoping you leave with one first step for uh, a, a commitment to immediately taking something that you currently do that's not as good a habit as you would like and putting in some work so that when you go on autopilot, this one thing that you'd like to switch is switched. So leaving already committed to one change and implementing it right away. Many people come to me and they are paralyzed with fear. They feel that the landscape has shifted so much that they don't have a solid ground. They feel that language is a minefield and they're going to step on something and explode something and they're going to get canceled or they're going to explode a relationship or they're going to be embarrassed. Some people are more concerned with the harm they might do to somebody else. Some people are more concerned that it's going to show them to bad advantage and there are going to be negative consequences for them. But paralysis is never the answer because I'm here to tell you that unless you've put in work, your language habits are filled with bias that is being transmitted to other people. And until you put in the work to shift little by little problematic things that you're saying and shift them to the inclusive alternative, you are going to be guaranteed to create problems. So if you're paralyzed with fear and you're not saying something, guess what? The silence sounds bad to somebody waiting to hear you talk up. So incorporating other perspectives is not easy. It takes time. So it's this process of identifying who do you need to learn about or what history do you need to learn about, and then making an education plan that might involve hiring somebody. It can often involve something as simple as um, diversifying your social media, diversifying your content intake. So if you usually watch movies about a certain kind of person, switching. If you usually read books about a certain kind of person, switching. If you usually read blogs about one kind of person, switching, etc. And eavesdropping. The internet is filled with conversations that you can eavesdrop on and not be a burden to anybody and ask people to educate you and instead educate yourself. I think when it comes to inclusive language, sometimes people come in worried that they're going to be judged, that they're going to be lectured at, they're going to be talked down to. And I just want to tell you that I'm here to share with you my own learning journey. We're going to work together to figure out what's appropriate for your community because I come in with the expertise from linguistic anthropology, but you come in with the expertise for your practice community and the communities that you serve. And so we're going to bring those two areas of expertise together and work together and then create something useful that you can take away.